Hey, good evening, everybody. It's really, really great, great to see you. I, uh, qu quite a week here at New Hope, uh, a good week. I served in the uh, nursery Tuesday night. Uh, I hadn't planned on it. Uh, my wife was in there, and I, just, I went back there to, before the service to see how she was doing and to suggest that they, they would give me one of those beepers, and if she got in over her head, she could buzz me, and I'd pick her up on the side door, and we'd make a run for it. <laughs> I mean, we have people who are in therapy because they served in the nursery. <laughs> so I, I found her back there in the nursery with a little guy who really wasn't so little, and his name was Maverick, sitting on her lap. And he looked perfectly contented, all was well. And so as I started to leave, Maverick started crying. And when I went back in, Maverick stopped crying. And then when I stepped out again, Maverick cried. When I went back in, Maverick stopped. So I was stuck and I knew it. In the nursery for the night. Well, I had a good time. It was good, it was good for me, and I, I had fun. With, and I taught Maverick how to throw a ball, thankfully a, a very soft ball. I say that because Maverick had a unique way of throwing. He, had a, he preferred a two-handed over-the-head throw, which was astonishingly hard. And I tried to teach him how to share as well, to throw the ball to... Easton, another new buddy of mine, and Maverick would walk right up to Easton, about one foot away from him, and with his over-the-head, two-handed grip, he would throw the ball as hard as he could, and it would boink Easton on the head, and they would both stand there and laugh. <laughs> now, Bella also had a ball. But Bella had absolutely no intentions of sharing that ball with anyone. Do you know if there are three kids in a room with three balls, all three kids will want the same ball. That's just the way it is. That was Tuesday night. I didn't serve in the nursery Wednesday night. I was recovering from Tuesday night. But I had so much fun. I decided to sign up for nursery duty on a regular basis every seven years. <laughs> I can't wait till the next time. But I'll tell you what, when you see those folks back there, Anna and Kim and, and, and those volunteers who serve in the nursery, tell them thanks, would you? Tell them that you appreciate their service because it is, it is truly a loving ministry. And I really did enjoy it. Well, tonight I, I want to talk about a prepared people for a prepared place. Shirley Boone, Pat Boone's wife of 65 years, passed away Friday morning. And Pat said, we lived a wonderful, blessed life together for 65 years. He said, I parted with my better half for a little while, but we don't die, he said. We just move on to another place. And today was her moving day. She's changed uh, her address is all and moved to a different mansion that I expect to join her in one day. The hope of heaven. Let's see what Jesus said about heaven, a familiar passage of Scripture. In fact, it's so familiar. Uh, in the King James Version, I, I want to read it from the King James Bible. It's John chapter 14. Tempted to stop there at verse 6, but, but we need to go beyond that, and we'll conclude at verse 11. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God... Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I, I would have told you. And everything's going back to the trustworthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If it were not so, I, I would have told you. I, I would not have left you in the dark about such an important matter. And then he said something that was truly astonishing, something no one had ever said before, no one has ever said since. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Everything is so explosive here. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. So I was visiting with my leprechaun friend, helping him gather a herd of unicorns when a pixie appeared and sprinkled us with stardust, after which we were both miraculously able to fly. And fly we did. You know, some people think of Christianity about like that. Make-believe, myth, a concoction of fiction and fantasy and, and fable with heaven being the, the biggest myth of all. They tell us that we believe in heaven because we want to believe in heaven, and that's the only reason. They tell us we believe in heaven because we just don't want to believe that this life is all that there is. Well, tonight I, I want to put out a little smorgasbord, and it's not the best choice of words, and in fact, it's not the best idea of smorgasbords for suppers or sermons, probably. But I want to talk to you about, about why I believe in heaven and what heaven is like according to the Scriptures. And I, I don't want to just state the obvious. So I hope we perhaps can learn some things tonight. First of all, I, I, there is a heaven. Let's start with that premise. And why do I believe there is a heaven? Well, I believe heaven is real, and I believe in heaven because of the one who taught us about heaven. And if you, if you walk away with nothing else but that, you have you have something rock solid tonight. I believe in heaven because of the one who taught us about heaven. My belief in heaven goes far beyond what I want to believe. It's a matter of what God has said. Early in his ministry, Billy Graham was in a small town to preach. He wasn't well known then, and he was just getting started, and he was in that small town, and he wanted to mail a letter, and he asked a young boy walking along the sidewalk where the local post office was in that small town, and the young boy told him, and Billy thanked him, and afterwards Billy said, by the way, young man, I'm going to be preaching tonight, and if you'll come and hear me, I'll tell you how to get to heaven. The little boy thought for a moment. He said, no, thank you, sir. He said, you don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> well, what the young boy didn't realize is that Billy Graham knew how to get to heaven. He knew how to get to heaven because the Bible tells us how to get to heaven. Jesus tells us how to get to heaven. The word heaven is found over 600 times in the Bible. Jesus mentions heaven some 70 times in the Gospel of Matthew alone. 
So the cynics, the agnostics, the critics of faith are not up against me and you. They're not up against Billy Graham. They're not up against the church. They're up against Christ himself who taught us about heaven. We have read his very precious words this evening. So what can I tell you about heaven? What can you tell me, preacher? You ever been there? No, I lived in West Virginia, and they called it almost heaven. But it didn't seem like much like heaven to me. No, I've never been to heaven. But you see, I've talked to one who has. In fact, I've talked to one who's building a mansion up there for you and me. I'm talk, uh, one, I've talked to one who is an expert on heavenly things. One who has never made a mistake and has never lied. I've talked to one whose knowledge exceeds that of all the, the scientists and the philosophers and the doctors and the preachers. In fact, I've talked to one who came from heaven and he's ascended back into heaven. And more accurately, he, he's talked to us about heaven. And this is what he says, and Pastor Jeff, thank you, and Pastor Brett, thank you, because everything that's been said tonight has focused on this all-important issue, this fundamental issue, and that is trust. Can I trust him? And he said, you trust in God, trust also in me. I'm as trustworthy as God himself. Trust in me because I am trustworthy. I am as trustworthy as God. Trust in me because I am God. All our questions are answered. All our fears are put to rest. All our issues are resolved. All our needs are met in the all-important and all-powerful exercise of trusting in him. Everything goes back to that, trusting in God. Trust in God, trust also in me. Now, anytime you're receiving information from anybody, uh, if you're like me, and Lord, I hope you're not, but it, in some ways maybe it could be a good thing. If you're like me, I hope there's a healthy dose of cynicism, or at least some spirit of discrimination and discernment in you and you don't just naively swallow everything you're fed or believe everything you're told. You put everything to the test of Scripture. Could I get an amen? Information given is only as credible as the one who gives it. And in John chapter 11, the Lord Jesus raised a man from the dead. And in John chapter 20, he will rise from the dead himself. So in between John chapter 11 and John chapter 20, we have John chapter 14. Something tells me I can believe Jesus when he says what he says. I think he walks around with pretty impressive credentials. I don't know about you, but I haven't raised anyone from the dead lately. And I certainly have been raised, been raised from the dead myself. None of us have that on our resume. And so who among us could say, would dare say, you trust in God, trust also in me. Or who of us could say, I am the resurrection and the life. Or who of us could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If there is no heaven, Jesus lied to us and he deceived us about the most important matter of all, our eternal destiny. So my friend, I believe in heaven tonight because of the one who taught us about it. I don't know what we sell these taped sermons for. I don't know, but whatever it is, it's, it's now worth it because of the ground we've already covered. Secondly, I want you to know that heaven cannot be boring. Look at verse 2. 
Christ said, in my Father's house are <laughs> many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. No one will, in heaven will ever say, you know, I'm thinking of moving on from here. I'm looking for greener pastures. This place has not lived up to my expectations. This heaven thing just isn't working for me. I wish I was back in Nebraska. Apologies, Pastor Brett. I know you can take it. There's no complaint department in heaven because there's no need for one. Heaven is Eden, it's bliss, it's paradise. Heaven is all heaven promises to be. Jesus calls it my Father's house. He's presenting it to us in terms that we can understand. We know houses, we know rooms, we know places. And since this is the Father's house, and Jesus is the chief architect and builder of our eternal home, it's unthinkable that heaven could be boring. Now, many think of heaven as, as a place that well, we're really not doing anything. You're pretty much doing nothing forever. You're floating around on a cloud, playing a harp, singing hymns, kind of an endless, monotonous existence. You're a zombie living in zombie land. The science fiction writer Isaac Asimov believed that. He said, I don't believe in the afterlife. So I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever, he said, the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. Well, heaven is not boring. How do I know that? Because Almighty God is not boring. The psalmist knew that. He said in Psalm 16, 11, In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are what? Pleasures forevermore. Joy unending, pleasures unimagined. Are you kidding me? Heaven boring? Job's with Job's God, who laid the, found, the earth's foundation and marked off its dimensions? The God who created the universe with the power of His Word from its atoms to its solar systems, and He holds it all together by the same. The God who created this uniquely beautiful planet and hangs it on nothing and keeps it spinning like a top, the God who colors the sky at sunset with his palette of endless colors and hues, the God who makes the sun shine in the day and the stars magically twinkle at night, the God who sends flashes through the sky for his light show and thunder for his applause, the God who scooped out those oceans with the palm of his hand and keeps them in place with an invisible wall, the God who created the animals of the fields and the fish of the sea, and the God who puts the twitter and the robin's song and the roar in the lion's mouth and the biosonar system in the well, you're telling me his heaven will be boring? My friend, if you believe that, you do not know God, you do not know heaven, and I'm sorry, but you do not know what you are talking about. Heaven, it will be beautiful. It will be magnificent. It will be radiant. It will be breathtaking. When I was a little boy raised in an unchristian home, my grandmother, who was a Christian, and I didn't get to see her very often, three or four times in my life, and when I got to see her, she took full advantage of it. One day when everybody was gone or taking a nap, she pulled me aside. She set me on the side of the bed and she told me about heaven. She told me about resurrection day. She told me about being with the Lord. 
She painted a picture for me. She wasn't an eloquent or an educated woman, but she painted a, a picture for me in the intimacy of that moment that was so profound, I've never forgotten it. I never will forget it. Jesus used her like an artist to paint that picture in my mind. And I'll tell you one thing, it was anything but boring. Heaven's not going to be boring. Too many saints to meet, too many places to explore, with surprises around every corner, and not one of them unsafe. Now, you can forget boring. It won't be found in heaven. You know, it may not be a well-known truth, but it is certainly an important one, and that is there's going to be work in heaven. There will be work in heaven. We will serve Him in heaven. Heaven will be a place of rest and reward, but also new responsibility. We will have work to do in heaven. Not a laborious kind of work, not by the sweat of our brow, but work that only and always thrills and fulfills. Twice in Revelation we are reminded that we will serve Him in heaven. Revelation 22 and verse 3 says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. Revelation 7, 15, they are before the throne of God and they serve Him day and night in His temple. What kind of service will it be? Well, I don't know, but I, I'm quite confident that it will be a service that will be in keeping with our dreams and our passions and the way in which God has gifted us. What do you like to do on earth? What's your passion? You know, if you think I can preach now and... and some of you don't, but when we get to heaven, I think I'm going to be able to preach in heaven because it's about the only thing I can do here on earth. It's God's call and God's gift to me. And the faithful exercise of that gift is my gift back to Him and my gift to His church. I think I'll be doing that in heaven. If you like to sing on earth, wait till you get to heaven. If you like to play an instrument on earth, wait till you get to heaven. You see, God wired you the way He wired you, not just for earth, but for eternity. One eloquent preacher suggested heaven is, quote, alive with a perpetual hum of industry, which he described as being as free from care and toil, fatigue, as is the wing stroke of the jubilant lark when it soars into the sunlight of a fresh, clear day and spontaneously and for self-relief pours out its thrilling carol. Heaven will be a place of glorious, fulfilling activity. Thirdly, Heaven will be heaven for everyone who's there. Heaven's not just heaven for some people. It's heaven for everyone who's there. There's no need to run polls in heaven to see how many are happy. Some of you are city folks. You like to be where the action is. You don't mind the high rises. You'd like to live in one. You don't mind the traffic. It's invigorating to you. You like the city life. And for you, heaven is a city. Hebrews 11.10 tells us Abraham was looking for what? A city <laughs> whose builder and maker is God. But some of you are country folk. You had it with the city. If you never saw another city in your life, you'd be just fine. You love the country. And for you, heaven is country living. Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 says of the heroes of faith, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Heaven will be your kind of place. Now, let me pose a potential problem. I've heard people say, and, I'll, and, and in all honesty, I've, I've I think I probably have had similar thoughts. How can heaven be heaven, knowing some people, people who have hurt me, are in heaven? I don't know how comfortable I could be knowing they are just around the corner from me, and with my luck, they'd be assigned the mansion right next door to mine. 
You might be surprised to know how many people grapple with that issue. Well, listen, I don't have the answers, but I, I'm, I know the Lord is able to take care of all that. And perhaps when we get to heaven, there'll be enough change within us that we can see good in people that we, that we didn't see on earth, that we can see people like Jesus sees them, that we'll have a capacity to love and forgive and forget that we didn't have on earth. In heaven, there's no carnality. There's no works of Satan. There's no darkness within us or around us or in others. Carol and I were in West Virginia for our second visit and our second weekend to preach and, and meet the people in a church and to pray about the possibility of becoming their pastor, the pastor of Faith Christian Fellowship. And up to this point, we felt very good about it and seen God had given several confirmations. And when we got into the hotel, they had a basket for us. And that was very sweet and thoughtful. And it had fruit in it. And it had sleeves of golf balls, which I thought was an additional confirmation of our calling there. And there was a card in the basket. And when I opened the card, it had just two words in it. And I can't imagine two words that would have hit me harder. I can't imagine two words that would have touched my soul more deeply. Those two words, welcome home. That's heaven. Yeah, heaven is is the home for which we've always longed, never quite been able to find on earth. My friend, heaven is the home for which we were created. Heaven is that place where we will never feel more at home, more relaxed, more content, more at peace, more fulfilled, more happy, more at home. Then fourthly tonight, I must say this about heaven, and that is not everybody goes to heaven. Again, I take you back to what Jesus said, our authority. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You know, people are always asking, how can a loving God allow anyone to go to hell? And it sounds so noble and so enlightened, doesn't it? So compassionate. The truth is, it's none of that. And they never ask, how can a just and righteous and holy God allow sinful men to go to heaven? Can you imagine thieves and con men and rapists and murderers allowed into heaven? It wouldn't be heaven very long, would it? God allows men to go to heaven because that's what they've chosen. God allows men to go to hell because that's what they've chosen. They have rejected God. How, would, how could God force them into his heaven? How long would heaven be heaven without the unrepentant, with God-haters in it? Now, everyone can go to heaven, Everyone is given the opportunity because Jesus died for everybody. He paid the price for everyone's sins, but not everyone will go to heaven. And so the sinner is in a no-win category. He is, uh, he's in a no-win category all the way because he doesn't want to go to hell, but he really doesn't want to go to heaven either. He'd be so out of place there worshiping God, serving God, surrounded by all those Christians. He'd be worse off than me in the nursery. He'd be stuck forever. Heaven is the believer's promise, the believer's hope and assurance. And when it comes to death, when it comes to leaving this world, when it comes to loved ones who have left this world, when it comes to eternity, only the believer can embrace and, and rejoice in the hope of heaven. 
And to the one who has trusted in Jesus, to the one who has fully embraced him as not a way, but the way, not a life, but the life, not a truth, but the truth, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, think about this. Everybody's banking on something, aren't they? The atheist, atheist is banking on the belief that there is no God. The Buddhist is banking on Buddha. The Muslim is relying on good works. I'm trusting, I'm putting all my weight on Jesus Christ because I know too much about him to do anything else. I believe Jesus is the expert on heaven. I believe he's the only one. And when it came time for him to tell us about heaven, you know what he talked about? He talked about himself. He only talked about himself. He uses the word I, me, my, myself over 20 times in that little text I read to you tonight. He only talked about himself because there is no other answer. He only talked about himself because he is all we need. Would you stand with me as we look to him in prayer tonight? Listen. I don't know how to make it more clear. I agonize and I struggle and I say, oh Lord, I'm a simple man and give me the words. Give me the insights. Give me the direct line from A to B to tell people, lost people, how to get to heaven. And I don't know how, how to do it other than to tell you, put your faith in Christ. Trust in Him. I read many years ago, dozens of years ago, and it just came back to my mind of a missionary that was in a tribe in Africa, and they had no Bible, and he was translating the Bible into their, their language. And when he got to the word faith and trust and belief, they had no such word. And so he wrestled and struggled and prayed about that. Lord, what do I tell him? And when he said that, he sat down in a chair and he said, tell him it's like sitting in a chair. Put all your weight on. And so he translated it in a way in their language that said, put all your weight upon Christ. We sang, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And that songwriter had it right, and he repeated it. All other ground is sinking sand. Can we pray together? And if you don't know Christ, if you're not a Christ follower, if you haven't given your life to Him, if you haven't trusted Him completely, tonight can be your night, and tonight should be your night, because the Bible declares today is the day of salvation. Put your faith and your trust in Him. Our wonderful Lord, our living Lord, our loving Lord, our Lord of infinite wisdom, we thank you tonight for such a precious truth so simply and succinctly stated for us in your word. How we thank you for the one who came. Came from heaven, came to earth and declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And demonstrated the, the truthfulness of a statement in the works he performed and invited us to examine his life, explore his works, and let those works confirm his words. So tonight we thank you for the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus, who he is, all he is, more than a good teacher, more than a philosopher, more than a moral example. He's our Lord, he's our Savior, and he's able to save to the uttermost. So if you, have, if you have not made that 
faith commitment to Christ. Pray with me right now in your heart. Lord, I come to you in simple childlike faith. I thank you that you will in no way cast me aside. But because of your love and your mercy, you've invited me. And I've sensed that invitation in my heart. And tonight I come to you. I come to you and I say, ask you, Lord, save me. Save this sinner. Bring me into fellowship with you. I ask you to give me your Holy Spirit to empower me to live for you and to want to live for you and to live my life in the light of eternity. How many are grateful tonight that you have the hope of heaven? Amen? Well, then you ought to want to sing about it and celebrate a little bit. Let's do that. Pastor Brad, lead us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You heard the story, the old story about the Sunday school class and the teachers said, how many of you kids want to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand except for one little boy. And she said, Johnny, don't you want to go to heaven? And he said, yeah, but... I thought you were getting a tour up today, you know. Don't get nervous. We're not talking about today. But what if it was today? Can you imagine? No, you can't. And neither can I. Can't begin to imagine. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard what God has prepared for those who love Him. And every once in a while, the Holy Spirit drops down just a little glimpse, just a little insight, just enough to keep us going. I want to encourage you to think about heaven this week and to live in the light of it. Read John chapter 14 and read other places. You can get out of concordance and look up the word heaven and, and trace heaven throughout the New Testament in particular. And if you don't have a concordance, do some cross-referencing from John chapter 14. And if you don't know how to do that, you really need to sign up for my hermeneutics class the next time I teach it. So think about two things this week, heaven and hermeneutics. Heaven and hermeneutics. Next week I'll teach you how to spell hermeneutics. Gives me a week to learn how myself. Yeah. God bless you. Let me pray with you before you go today. Father, we are, so, we are grateful people. We are grateful people, Lord, because we are blessed people. And every once in a while, Lord, you lift the blinders and you let us see into that which is to come. We're so thankful for what you saved us from, but what you brought us into. We thank you, Lord, that you planted the hope of heaven deep in our hearts. And I pray that we will be sojourners in this life with one eye on heaven as well as the road before us. May we serve you faithfully, gratefully, triumphantly till you come or till we leave to meet you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.